having some we're having some weather issues. Thankfully, it has not affected the Wi-Fi, so we're we're all good there. So it's good to see everyone. Welcome or welcome back. Now, in uh, in this talk, um, as Ari mentioned, we're going to talk about uh, we're going to talk about Irving Berlin and the Gershwins. Um, and you know, in a series like this, when you have nine sessions to cover something, it gives it gives us the luxury of taking our time. We don't have to talk about everything in every session. We can actually focus in some depth on a particular topic. But I will say though, just echoing that comment from the first session, Irving Berlin and the Gershwins wrote a lot of music, a lot of really good music. I'm not going to be able to mention it all today. I have chosen a few, let's call them choice examples of what's not only from their from their broad musical catalog, but I think the pieces of music that will help me illustrate certain points about them, which are most pertinent to the theme, the larger themes of our course, and really the contributions or the role of Jews in 20th century American music. Now, the the the, the title I chose, the loudest voices, as we shall see a little bit later. I chose that I chose that title very very deliberately and very specifically in reference to a short story. I'm going to read a little excerpt from later on. It's a metaphor for what it meant to be a second generation American Jew in early 20th century America and that whole process of balancing between one's Jewishness and a connection to the Jewish identity, to, one, to, to one's Jewish identity and the Jewish community. And on the one hand, versus being part of mainstream American culture and for Irving Berlin and the Gershwins being part of the mainstream American music scene and transplanting aspects of one to the other. And that's really what we're going to do today. Because remember last week we talked about Yiddish theater and Yiddish music, which was very much at the heart of the culture and identity of, of immigrant Jews in America from Eastern Europe. That was really their musical scene. But today we're going to start by talking what, I mean, what I've called both literally and metaphorically moving uptown. Now, I say literally because especially if you lived on the Lower East Side and you were able or your children were able to move out of the neighborhood, usually that move meant moving uptown. Some moved down to Brooklyn, but many early on moved to neighborhoods further uptown in Manhattan, whether it was the Upper West Side, whether it was Washington Heights, whether it was Morningside Heights. This is the era when the area, when the, the, the neighborhood known as Harlem was becoming Jewish. You know, there's a very good book by Jeffrey Gora called When Harlem Was Jewish. If you ever wondered why Yeshiva University today, which is at 180th and Broadway, is in an area that which today is not very Jewish, and why the Jewish Theological Seminary is in the middle of Morningside Heights, which is part of Harlem, YU is part of Spanish Harlem. The reason these institutions are located there is because when they were founded over a century ago, these were becoming very Jewish neighborhoods. But they were very specific kind of Jewish neighborhoods. They were what sociologists and demographers called secondary settlements. This is where Jews moved when they moved the left the Lower East Side. So this, it, we're talking about the era when Jews in New York are beginning to move uptown. And whatever whatever city you're from, this is the this is the era when, or this is the point when Jews are leaving the immigrant neighborhood to go settle in some new neighborhood with all the changes that connotes. So it's an important period of transition. But moving uptown isn't only referring to a literal move. It's also referring to a cultural move. It's a metaphor here. And uh, this is the point when Jewish musicians, performers, composers, like Irving Berlin and the Gershwins, who are our, our focus for today, this is when they begin to move beyond the world of Yiddish music and Yiddish theater and become part more become more integral parts of Tin Pan Alley, Broadway, and they begin to help remake, refashion the music scene, not only the Jewish music scene, but the whole music scene in New York City. And I think I, I want to make sure that's clear because, you know, the, what, what, they, they, have a, they have similar childhoods, they have similar backgrounds, but they also, as young adults, they found, and as adults, they found themselves living in a world which was remarkably diverse, not only in terms of the people living there, Jews, African-Americans, Latinos, Italian-Americans, Polish-Americans, and, and the list goes on, but also a world which was full of different musical styles for each of these groups. So for someone engaged in the world of music, the musical sounds you would hear, and, and, and not even by just, not even if you, 
going to a concert or a theater, just on the street, what you could hear were all kinds of musical sounds. So this is an era of blending. And I would say that, you know, the term that's familiar to us about this point in time is the melting pot. This is the era of the melting pot, not only for American Jews, but for American society in general. So I think it's worth noting that this metaphor of the melting pot really has two complementary meanings, both of which are very pertinent for us today. So first of all, the melting pot has the image where immigrants coming to the United States were expected, to, uh, how do I say it? check your ethnic or cultural baggage at the door at Ellis Island. And once you came to the United States, you were supposed to become American, according to that 20, early 20th century ideal of what a real American was in terms of language, in terms of dress, in terms of, in terms of manners, in terms of culture, in terms of the book you read. That's one aspect of the melting pot. But the other aspect that's associated with the image of the melting pot is a blending of all kinds of cultures together. So there was this expectation that everybody checked their cultural baggage and it happened to a point. But beyond that point, people from all different walks of life, from all different cultures, especially in a bustling urban place like New York City or other big cities, they, they, they were bringing their own culture and background and they were coming into contact with others and they were blending them together. And that is very much the story of Irving Berlin and the Gershwins, bringing their Jewish cultural baggage with them, background with them, and then blending it with that broader array of people they were encountering in New York City. So let me say a little bit about their backgrounds and how they got into the world of music and what they did when they got there. Let's start with Irving Berlin. Irving Berlin's name from he wasn't wasn't born Irving Berlin he was he was uh, born is Israel Balin he came to the United States at the age of five from Russia from a shtetl in Russia he had very little memory of his childhood in Russia in fact one of the only things he remembered from Russia was basically hiding in the woods near his house while his house was being burned down during a pogrom so he didn't exactly have happy memories but that memory was was important, was formative for him because he is someone who really loved and appreciated living in the United States. He had a predisposition to love everything American simply because what he what he left behind was so difficult and frightening and traumatizing. I don't know about you, but in my own family, my own grandparents came with similar with a similar baggage. They left a very difficult situation. And from the moment they arrived in Detroit, they absolutely loved everything about Detroit, America. It could do no wrong for them. They had that deep appreciation. Irving Berlin's family, like, well, I'm sorry, Isidore Balin's family, when he was a child, they were poor. His parents struggled to make ends meet, as often was the case with that generation. They both, for a time, worked in one sort of sweatshop or another. They both did odd jobs. Uh, his father was a Hebrew tutor. He gave Hebrew lessons. He was also the chazan. I wouldn't call him the cantor exactly. He was the chazan at a small shul on the Lower East Side. That's where er, that's where young Isidore got his musical background. And as a child, he didn't know much about music really until the age of 10. And for him, he had this experience at the age of 10 where he heard his, his friend Maxi was giving a violin recital. You know, part of that generation was the parents wanted their children. Part of becoming American was learning how to play an instrument, you know, and the parents could shep nachas from that. So he's watching his friend play the violin. He had very little interest in music, but he was absolutely smitten by the music. And he took this interest in music and it really launched him in, in, on this career of trying to learn as much music as he could, trying to learn how to play the piano, which not surprisingly, he did very, very quickly. And of course, Irving Berlin goes on to be one of the premier American songwriters, Jewish or otherwise, of the 20th century. The Gershwins came from a similar background. They have a similar story. They weren't born Ira and George Gershwin. They were born Israel and Jacob Gershwin, which was later Americanized to Gershwin. Now, they weren't born in Eastern Europe. They were born in America, but they also came from a family that was poor, that struggled, uh, but also was trying very hard to become American. 
You know, it's interesting. In both of their families, they both had a similar family story. And this was something very typical and common to Jewish immigrants from that generation. When they came to America, the first thing, the first photograph they would send back to the old country was when they had enough, when they had enough money, they would buy some American clothes, dress up as Americans, take a picture and send it back to the family in the old country before they learned English, before they had a stable situation, before anything else. The first thing they do is they wanted people in the old country, not only to know that they were there and safe, but they were taking the first step toward becoming American. Uh, and in the, in the Gershman family, uh, the parents wanted the children to become musicians. They bought a piano. They, when they had enough money, they bought a piano for the two Gershwin brothers and for their sister Francine, who really was the first to have an interest and an ability in music to learn how to play the piano. She was, you know, she was very much, she was very musical until she got married. Then she and had children and didn't have much time for that. That's why we don't hear very much about Francine Gershwin. We hear more about her brothers. Her brothers were you know, given piano lessons. Ira, who eventually became the, became the songwriter, the lyric, the lyricist, he, was, he always remembered being very relieved that his brother, Jacob, who changed his name to George, he was the music guy. So Ira didn't have to learn how to play the piano that well, though he certainly could. So both Irving Berlin and the Gershwins had this background. They grew up in this very typical Jewish immigrant situation, but eventually they wanted to get out. The Gershwin brothers went to high school. Uh, Irving Berlin didn't have very much in an education, but as teenagers, each, each in their own way, they began to look for new opportunities. So let me talk about that one at a time. Let's focus now on Isidore or Israel Balin, who eventually changed his name to Irving Berlin. You know, the family changed it from Balin to Bayline, B-A-L-I-N-E, which eventually became Berlin. In other words, they're Americanizing their name. But what I would emphasize, as did the Gershwins, but what I would emphasize is uh, Americanizing one's name is an example of what I mean about trying to live, enter this new world without fully abandoning the old world. In other words, Neither Irving Berlin nor the Gershwins were very religious. They didn't, you know, we would say they weren't very Jewish, but they did have a sense of being Jewish and they did have a strong connection to that cultural world in which they grew up in. And, and for Irving Berlin, he began to look for work, something he could do in the world of music. And, and the job he found is a job that was known as a song plugger. Now, when I read this, I had, I had to Google what a song plugger was, although when you hear what it is, it makes perfect sense. A song plugger is someone who was able to read sheet music and play lots of different things, in this case, on the piano. And they would go to a department store or a hotel, and they would sit in the lobby or in an open area of the department store, and they would basically just play songs, and they would get paid to play the songs. The people trying to market the songs and find an audience for these songs they would look for opportunities for people to play the songs. And that's really how Irving Berlin got his start in the music industry as a song plugger. This is just someone who could just play the piano. Eventually he was noticed by others in that world who saw, A, he was a very good piano player, but he was a really good sight reader. But eventually he tried to use, to play, he played some of his own songs which got him noticed pretty early on. Now, uh, he uh, one of, one of the one of the first set of songs he really that really got him noticed was uh, there, there was a show a vaudeville show that was called Jew Face. It was produced by a number of Jewish musicians and songwriters. I know when we hear when we hear something called Jew Face today, it doesn't sound very flattering. But it was called Jew Face in reference to blackface which at that time, again, another problematic term today, but a hundred years ago, blackface didn't carry with it necessarily a, a derogatory or racist meaning. Rather, it was simply a style of music that was prevalent in the African American community and a style of music for, sh for popular shows. So Jewface was an attempt to replicate that kind of popular show. And what Jewface was really was simply a collection of songs English language songs on, because remember, he's moved beyond the world of Yiddish and Yiddish theater, even though he clearly had some familiarity there. 
And these were different songs about, you know, the lighthearted songs about, you know, being Jewish in America and, uh, and trying to be part of one world and part of another world. There's one particular song he wrote for that show that I want to listen to because it's, it's an example of the early work of Irving Berlin, but it's also one of the tunes, one of the motifs in the song sounds a little bit from, it's going to sound familiar to you. So, uh, Ari, let's, let, let's take a listen to a song he wrote called, for Jewface called, When Mose With His Nose Leads the Band. And I emphasize the lightheartedness of this. Down our way every day there's a band Life is gay when they play music grand When the noisy big bass drum With their noisy tom 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 Loud enough to wake up nearly all the land Happy Mose, he just shows all he knows When he leaves from his sing and repose No baton does Mose use But the thing he would refuse He's unique with nothing else but just his Baby, then start to play, plays all day. Oh, then says, sound your A, B, B, A. My yells, I want to play, we shall play. He knows the whole that grand and I can appear. Then they'll start in to blow, not their dough. Please, paint we all do know, and right I go. Oi, 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 but you stop. When Moses is no secret man, Captain Stein plays the rhyme, right. plays it fine. Fire with keeping. So I'll say two things about this. First of all, he, he uh, at one point in the song. He weaves in a little old-fashioned Jewish tune. I, I, he weaves in, da, 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 okay? But more importantly, I hope you noticed, at one point, this tune is, is incorporated into this song, or this tune he used for this song, da, 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 which, of course, we now recognize as, the, as one of the tunes from the song, God Bless America. So if you know anything about Irving Berlin, you know this is where the story is going. Eventually, he's going to write a song called God Bless America, which remarkably, he wrote it originally in 1918. And in 1938, it was re-recorded by, um, by um, Kate Smith, sorry, and almost became the new national anthem or a second national anthem for the United States. Now, the God Bless America part of that tune comes from Mose with his nose leads the band. Even more interesting, I think, is where the, is where the verses of the song comes from. So you got to picture this. Picture little is, you know, Israel Balin. He's heard all kinds of music in all different places on the street. He's also heard music in the synagogue. And remember, his father leads the service in the synagogue. So he's heard the following very prevalent tune from the Saturday morning service. This is a, this is the tune from the first paragraph of the prayer known as the Amida, which is a, 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 a consistent part of the service. So there's a point in the service where it goes, Ha'el ha'gadol ha'gibor ve'hanora el elyon. So picture, picture Balin as a teenager, you know, he's just toying around on the piano looking for tunes and he's going like this, Da 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 and then that's with his right hand. And then with his left hand, he decides to add a bass note and he gets da 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 which maybe you recognize as from the mountains to the prairie. So God Bless America, the tunes he found for God Bless America, one of them came from an earlier English language Jewish ditty that he wrote called Mose with his nose leads. They wrote called Mose with his nose leads the band. And the other part, he borrowed from the liturgy, the synagogue liturgy, and he turned that into a song. And that's where God Bless America comes from. Now, isn't that remarkable? I happen to think it is. 
that you've got these little Jewish songs that are woven by this remarkable song songwriter into a tune which becomes one of the signature tunes of the United States. And by the end of the 1930s, it's so much part of American culture. In fact, we can't go on. We got to listen to a little bit of it. So let's just listen to a little bit of God Bless America sung by Kate Smith in 1938. Just a little bit. You can listen for both tunes. That was one of many smash hit songs he wrote. Now, we could go through others of his songs and find Jewish elements to them, but none, I think, as overt and clear as God Blessed America. But what an amazing thing that this song, not only that was written by this Jewish, Im this, this Jewish immigrant in New York, but also that it's just, it, it's built on Jewish little tunes, including the liturgy. We're going to see one more example of that as well. Now, he has many songs. We could go through them. I put one more on the handout called Cohen Owes Me $97. It's worth a listen to, but, I, but for the sake of time, I want to turn to the Gershwins now because I want to make, I want to give them so, enough time as well. The Gershwins, as I said, came from a similar background. They also, uh, George Gershwin, well, originally he was Jacob Gershwin, who, who eventually became George Gershwin. He also worked as a song plugger. Uh, Ira also find odd, found odd jobs like that. Eventually, they found they they, uh, they found work writing songs for small shows, and eventually they matured to be able to stay. They moved along and advanced enough to be able to begin writing their own music. Some they wrote music for vaudeville acts. They wrote music for Tin Pan Alley, and eventually they began to write music for this new platform for performance that was coming to be known as Broadway. Irving Berlin also wrote music for Broadway. Now, the whole Broadway story, I'm saving a whole session for that. At the session after Copeland next week is gonna be all about Broadway. So I'm not gonna talk that much about Broadway today, but I just wanna give you an example of an early Broadway hit, which like God Bless America, or as, as, Ber as Irving Berlin did with God Bless America, George Gershwin borrowed the tune from the liturgy. Now, if you've ever been to a synagogue service, there's a crucial point in the service when someone is called to the Torah or the line that begins the morning and the evening service, Shacharit and Mariv, and the line, you know, Baruchu at Adonai Hamvorach, blessed be God who is blessed. And the way that is chanted is Baruchu at Adonai Hamvorach, and George Gershwin, he grew up, he spent time in a synagogue. He was very familiar with this. 
just as Irving Berlin was familiar with the liturgy from the morning service, which he used for God Bless America. So what George Gershwin's going to do is he's going to take that tune, Baruch Hu et Adonai Amvorach, and he's going to soften it a little bit by blending it with the sounds or the motifs of jazz music, which he heard on the street and from his encounters with African-American musicians. He's going to blend that, that line from the liturgy with this jazz sounds, and it's going to go from Baruch Hu et Adonai Hamvorach. I think some of you hear it already. It ain't necessarily so. One is borrowed from the other. There's another interesting dimension too, using that tune for it, it ain't necessarily so. Because if you know the play Porgy and Bess, which we'll discuss more when we talk about Broadway, this particular song, well, first let me say, the Baruch Hu prayer is, is one of the closest things in Judaism to there, to there being an article of the creed. It is a statement of faith in God either a statement that a bar bar mitzvah makes, a statement that launches the service, anyone called to the Torah. It is a declaration of faith, but the song, It Ain't Necessarily So, is a song that is questioning that very faith. It ain't necessarily so, it ain't necessarily so. The things that you liable to read in the Bible ain't necessarily so. Ira Gershwin, who wrote the lyrics there, he took the concept of the Baruch Hu and he turned it on its head for this song. And that's what this remarkable song is. It's not only taking an idea, a musical theme from the service, but it's also taking a concept from the service and inverting it. Now, this is, first of all, an example of the Gershwins, you know, break, this is their break with traditional Judaism. They're moving beyond it. But there's something else I think very interesting and almost ironic because this notion of challenging and questioning and skepticism is itself very, a, a very Jewish thing. Being skeptical, asking questions, challenging established norms, in this case, an established statement of faith, is something which has been woven into the fabric of Judaism for a very long time. And George Gershwin, even though he wasn't very Jewish by any religious standard, he still had that natural Jewish skepticism. It's also worth noting that that natural Jewish skepticism and willing to challenge established authority is also a very American ideal. It's one of those places where traditional Jewish culture and American culture intersect and blend together, and it makes it easier for an individual to go from one to the other. So with all that in mind, let's listen to a minute or two of it ain't necessarily so. I gotta get busy and make me some kindle. Yeah. 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 Adam. Yeah. Then he see that Adam got one extra rib to spare. Yeah. So he take that extra rib yeah. and he make woman from a sparrow. Yeah. 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 Lord God. The Lord God. Kinfolk. That's right. Kinfolk. The Lord got you. And the good book got you. You all got the good book man. But it ain't necessarily so. It ain't necessarily so. The things that you're liable to read in the Bible, it ain't necessarily so. Little David was small, but oh my. Little David was small, but oh my. He fought big Goliath, who laid down and died. Little David was small, but oh my. Okay, I, can, I, I, think I know, we can listen to the whole thing. I, it's hard to turn off the middle of that great tune. And, and we'll return to Porgy and Bess when we talk about Broadway. It's a great example. They, they took this Jewish theme and they wrote it for a play which is predominantly about a very different group of people, but it expresses something very similar. Now, some of the things they wrote together were more lighthearted. Another one of my favorite George and Ira Gershon songs is an, uh, is, is an ode to, to they wrote to, uh, an ode that they wrote in, in you know, to honor 
four famous Russian violinists. Remember I mentioned that in that generation, ch children, young children learning an instrument was part of the ideal, that American idea. You got to learn to play the piano or the violin. You know, I grew up in the 70s. I, I, I also had to learn a musical instrument. I, you know, I took clarinet lessons for a couple of years and I was terrible. I was the exact opposite of Benny Goodman, if you want to know how good I was. Um, but it, it's it's part of this Jewish ideal. You know, you want to get an education and learning a musical instrument is important. So this homage to these four these four Russian violinists, Misha Elman, Yasha Chepitz, Tasha Seidel, and Sasha Jacobson, the Gershwins wrote a song called Misha, Yasha, Tosha, and Sasha. And it's, it's an homage to them, but it also incorporates that sort of, you know, uh, violin lessons being part of the Jewish, this this immigrant or second generation immigrant Jewish household. Let's take a little listen to Misha Yasha Tosha Sasha. that tribute is there this is a tribute to four of the greatest violinists in the world and they deliberately have some really average violin lesson by playing going on at the beginning and at the end interspersed that's how that's how these violinists were understand it it's understood in the gershwin home and in other jewish homes it's something you aspire to but there's also a recognition that most people who learn the violin aren't going to aren't going to reach that level i have a brother who tried learning to play the violin for 13 years he tried his heart out god bless him he sounded like the beginning of that song, but he really tried. Now, there's one other Gershwin song I want to mention, and then I'm, and then I, I obviously can't finish this 
this session without saying something about Christmas music. So let me mention one other George Gershwin tune, one of his more famous and real and what uh, famous uh, famous uh, pieces, and really one of his magnum opus. And this is this is something he wrote called Rhapsody in Blue. Now, in the mid 1920s, George Gershwin, as this up and coming composer, he was invited to be part of this experimental circle of composers, really some of the youngest up and coming brightest composers in New York City and some from other places as well. And they, they were from all walks. They were, they were Jews like George Gershwin. They were African-Americans, they were Italians, they were from all over the place and they were all bringing different musical sounds. And the purpose of this composing composition circle was to give each participant a chance to experiment a little bit, to press the envelope, to try incorporating something into music, which is not normally part of classical music. And for Gershwin, the, what he originally presented to this experimental music circle was something that eventually became Rhapsody in Blue, which is an absolutely remarkable piece of music. It's like 19 minutes long. We're not going to listen to the whole thing. We're only going to listen to the very beginning, because in, in some ways, it's the beginning that's of the, the most interest to us in this context right here. Because if you've ever heard Rhapsody in Blue, you know that Rhapsody in Blue begins with a clarinet solo, an extended clarinet solo. But, and there's nothing unusual about that, there was lots of classical music that had clarinet solos. Mozart loved the clarinet, but this isn't just a clarinet solo. This is a clarinet solo playing klezmer style music. In this experimental music group, the question George Gershwin is asking himself and the others there, and the question he's asking about American music and its ability to absorb different sounds and unconventional styles that weren't normally associated with highbrow classical music, would it be possible to include klezmer music in this corpus? Now let's keep in mind, klezmer music was something that was used, this was not highbrow music. Klezmer music is associated with Jewish weddings, other celebrations like that. Klezmer music in Eastern Europe was probably the equivalent of hillbilly music here, or early, early country Western music. It was something that it simply wasn't highbrow, but Gershwin decided he was going to, you know, he was going to defeat that stereotype or that caricature. And that was the, that was the background to him writing the opening to Rhapsody in Blue. So let's listen to about two minutes of this klezmer clarinet solo. Go ahead, Ari. Let's, let's listen to a little Rhapsody in Blue. Oh, I found a version with the uh, animation of Al Hirschberg. Okay, Ari, we can we can stop it there. I know. I I urge you li listen to all of it because it just gets better, and that version with that animation makes it even more interesting. 
So I, I want to emphasize here that, that the, the accomplishment, what Gershwin was able to do, what George Gershwin was able to do is he was able to take klezmer music, which most people outside the world, outside the Jewish world, didn't really know, and turn it into that. You know, in the early reviews of Rhapsody in Blue, none of the reviewers said, wow, klezmer music really is good. Most people who heard that, certainly who weren't Jewish, had never heard klezmer music before, or they certainly didn't, If even if they had, they didn't recognize this as klezmer music. What Gershwin was able to do is turn a style of music, which was something very distinctly Jewish, not part of mainstream musical, classical music or performative music outside that narrow world of the Jewish neighborhood and really turn it into something much larger and much grander. If, if I'm making a comparison, I'd say it's similar to something that Brahms did with Hungarian dances, where he was able to wo to weave in Roma gypsy music and those themes into the into the pantheon of classical music, into that songbook. I think that's a remarkable, remarkable achievement, and really just one of the crowning efforts of George Gershwin's musical career. So what we see is both Irving Berlin and and the Gershwins they're able to take these Jew these Jewish music, Jewish sounds. And not only not only inter integrate them into a broader pantheon of music, but they're able to turn them into music that all Americans want to listen to. Rhapsody in Blue was enormously successful. It wasn't enormously successful right away. A lot of people, when they first heard it, they didn't know how to understand it. And so it had a little bit of pushback. But within a year or two, it's what today we would call a bestseller. It, it, it went viral. Everybody wanted to hear it. Everyone wanted to find recordings of it or see it performed. Okay. Now, there's one last thing I have to mention, especially about Irving Berlin, because of all things that Irving Berlin is known for, in addition to, uh, in addition to God Bless America, he's also known as having written Christmas music. Now, remember, at the outset of this series last week, we asked about how we define something as Jewish music. And, and really, this is really a question. Is a Christmas song written by Irving Berlin, can we call this, how do we fit this in, in terms of the larger context of Jewish music? Well, believe it or not, the, the, the fact that this Jewish composer in 20th century America wrote a Christmas song in the broader span of Jewish history, I'm gonna speak in very broad terms, this was not that unusual, and it was not that original. The song was original. The music was original. But the fact of it is something which has been part of Jewish history for a very long time. Wherever Jews have lived and have encountered non-Jewish culture, foreign culture, Jews have always tried to draw the following line, the line between those aspects of that foreign culture which are religious in nature, which Jews have tended to say, that's not for us, versus those aspects of a foreign culture which are not religious in nature, which Jews have tended to embrace and absorb. I'll give you an old example, and then we can talk about this Christmas music. So the first encounter between Jews and the non-Jewish world was really in the ancient world, the encounter with Greek cult, the culture of the ancient Greeks, Hellenistic culture. And what Jews in in you know in ancient Israel did when they encountered Hellenistic culture is they looked at Hellenistic civilization and said, all the things that are religious, like giving sacrifices to Zeus, we're not going to do. But those things that are not religious, like language, like poetry, like philosophy, that were like the food that we're going to do, that we're definitely going to do. And that and Jews have been drawing that line. And here, I think there's a similar kind of line drawn, especially with respect to Christmas and early 20th century America. Because at the moment when Irving Berlin is writing this Christmas music, like White Christmas, Christmas itself and its relationship to American society is changing. This is the point where, certainly in America, and less so elsewhere, Christmas is becoming something which is not only a religious holiday. It's becoming something which is about things other than religion. Christmas, and, and by, by the time we get to the 1920s, Christmas, and I mean for Christians, I mean for all Americans, is not only about going to hear mass and celebrating the birth of Christ. That part the Jews weren't so interested in. 
That part they weren't so interested in. What they were more interested in is those parts of Christmas which were more cultural or American in nature. Like, for example, the gift giving, buying and giving gifts. Like, for example, the Christmas caroling, the Christmas music. And here is where Ber Irving Berlin is able to make that distinction because the Christmas music he wrote definitely mentions Christmas, but it's not religious music in nature. Take a song like White Christmas. Other than the word Christmas, you wouldn't really know it's a religious song. White Christmas is not a song about going to mass and celebrating the birth of the Lord. That's Noel, Noel, born as the son of Israel. Irving Berlin didn't write that. Chestnuts roasting over an open fire and other uh, uh, and and White Christmas. These are songs which, if we didn't know they were about Christmas, we could just as easily think they were about winter, which is something much more neutral. Now that's how it's possible for someone who is Jewish to write a Christmas song. But we also the other part of the question is why is it or isn't it odd or how do we explain that not only do you have someone Jewish like Irving Berlin writing Christmas music, you have someone like Irving Berlin writing the best Christmas music. And here's where that metaphor I mentioned, the loudest voice comes in. We have a short story that was written by a wonderful author named Grace Paley in 1959. She was the, the grandchild of immigrants and and she wrote about the immigrant experience of Jews in a story, a short story called The Loudest Voice. Now, the background to this story is it's an immigrant Jewish family. They haven't been in America very long. The daughter, go, the daughter Shirley goes to public school. In public school, they're doing the Christmas pageant. And she is cast as the baby Jesus in the Christmas pageant. This little Jewish girl is cast as the baby Jesus. So let me read a little excerpt where the story explains why this happened and why it's not that unusual. Quote, now surely you know, I suppose, that Christmas is coming. We are preparing a beautiful play. This is the teacher talking to her. Most of the parts have been given out, but I still need a child with a strong voice and lots of stamina. You know, I heard you read The Lord is My Shepherd in assembly yesterday. I was very impressed. Wonderful delivery. Now listen to me, Shirley Abramowitz. If you want to take the part and be in the play, repeat after me. I swear to work harder than I ever did before. I looked to heaven and said at once, oh, I swear. I kissed my pinky and looked at God. The teachers became happier and happier. We learned holy night without an error. How wonderful, said Mrs. Mrs. Glass, the student teacher. And to think that some of you do not even speak the language. That night, Mrs. Cornblue visited our kitchen for a glass of tea. You know Charlie Turner? The, the city boy, the city boy in Celia's class, a couple others, they got very small parts or, or no parts at all. It was in very, it was in very bad taste, it seemed to me. After all, it is their religion. Ah, explained my mother. What could Mr. Hilton do, the music teacher? They got very small voices. After all, why should they holler? The English language they know from the beginning by heart they're blonde like angels. You think it's so important they should get in the play? Christmas, the whole piece of goods, they own it. I was happy. I fell asleep at once. I had prayed for everyone. I expected to be heard. My voice was certainly the loudest. Who more than an immigrant kid would want to be part of this wonderful American, in this case, an American public school ritual known as the Christmas pageant? And for someone like Irving Berlin, or the Gershwins for that matter, who more than you know, the, ch the immigrant child or the children of immigrants who wants to make it in America, who is going to be more impelled to write a song about this wonderful moment of the American calendar, Christmas? Christians, they, they, they don't need to do it. Immigrants try harder. Immigrants work harder. You know, the way Lin-Manuel Miranda said, immigrants get the job done. Here's an example of the immigrant boy Irving Berlin getting the job done and writing the best Christmas music of all. And that's why we can explain that he doesn't celebrate Christmas, but he, he wanted it more. He felt more impelled. He was deeply immersed in that musical world and he was able to come up with the tunes that everyone liked. He had the loudest musical voice, which was able to write that Christmas music. So the music itself is not Jewish. 
White Christmas is not a Jewish song. But what's Jewish about the story is that the kid, the Jewish kid who wrote that song, like the little girl in the Christmas pageant, is very much a, a reflection of that experience of Jews in early 20th century America, trying, without leaving behind their Jewishness, trying to be a part of this larger musical world. Now, of course, the question we're going to ask and the question we're going to take on next week is, how far can we push this? How not Jewish can music be and still have some Jewish connection? Next week, when we talk about Aaron Copeland, we're going to have someone, it's sort of uh, the almost the inverse of Irving Berlin, who comes from this Jewish background and brings Jewish material. Aaron Copeland had very little in the way of a Jewish background. And the music he wrote, it's not obviously a overtly Jewish but his experience, his contribution as a, as a Jewish songwriter, as we'll see next week, is a natural extension of Irving Berlin and the Gershwins. That we'll see next week. Terrific. Thank you. We just have a few quick minutes. I had a few questions. If you have more questions, please feel free to um, put them in the chat. So one question was going back to the Jew Face album that you, sh you shared. Yeah. And I think Sandy asked this question, which is, was that intended for a Jewish audience? Was that intended for a um, a lower class audience? Was that Who was that intended for? Great question. So it wasn't intended only for a Jewish audience, but it was intended primarily for a Jewish audience. It was intended for that audience of, of, of young Jews in particular, who had, who had basically had new English, but still had the flavor of the shtetl and the traditional world in their minds. In other words, most of the people who went to that show were probably bilingual, English and Yiddish, had probably grown up with a background similar to, to Irving Berlin and, and the Gershwins. So they, they weren't really part of it as much as their parents had been, but they were still very familiar with it. And Yes, and and and, th and this was a popular song as opposed to a highbrow song. So most of the people in the audience were probably either working class Jews or lower middle class Jews. This was a popular song for a popular setting. So this wasn't going to be an opera. This was going to be in a music house where you go and and and, and after a time, the audience once they knew the song, they would sing along. And the parts of the song that were familiar, they would definitely start singing along. Related question. Um, not the Jew Face album, but Gershwin's later works and Berlin's, Berlin's later works. Did they percolate up to the highest echelons of society? I know that you've mentioned um, The Gilded Age, so we're a little bit past that now. Um, but it's a good show on TV. People should watch it. And I will send the link out if you haven't watched it. So we're past that period. Uh, but there's still probably this highbrow, lowbrow. Um, but, but given the fundamental role that these that, that, that these mus musicians now play in the American songbook, did their music, like their Christmas music, go up to that higher level, or was it still kind of kept into the lower and mid-levels of the American community population? Great, a great question. I would say by the end of by the end of the 1920s, the answer was absolutely yes. Rhapsody in Blue was it started off as a this experimental song, but it became very mainstream the same way that the music of Igor Stravinsky became mainstream, even though it wasn't mainstream at first. And Irving Berlin's songs and the list, you know, he wrote so many of them. These were big hits. I mean, God Bless America was more the rule than the exception for him. And partly it wasn't just that their music was so good and people loved the music, but the American upper, you know, upper class or the elite musical scene was changing during the 1920s from something being very more older and stodgy and white and waspy, you know, organ, you know, you know, you know, um, oriented around Stephen Foster into something that was blending different musical styles, that blend of music, especially jazz music and Jewish sounds and Italian sounds and Polish sounds, that was becoming the norm of upper-class elite American music. And in that context, Jewish songwriters like Irving Berlin and the Gershwins, as we'll see Aaron Copeland as well, were very much part. And so they reached, you know, Irving Berlin was not just the best Jewish songwriter. He was seen as the best or one of the top, maybe three best songwriters, period. And the Gershwins, were not far behind. So they were embraced by everyone. Great. Well, that's a good place to end. We are, this is um, 
part two of the nine part series. So a lot more music to go. Mm -hmm. Thank you all for joining us today and uh, keep healthy out there. Keep safe because I want you to be on more programs. So the only way you can be on more programs is if you're healthy. So, and thank you to Howard Dragotsky, who's been giving me a, uh, you know, a timeline of uh, updates on my chat as to um, all these particular performers and some music history. So thank you to Howard. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Have a great day. See you soon. See you next time, everybody. Shabbat shalom. Bye, everybody. Shabbat shalom.